Jose pushes him off. His guns go off. His gun goes out like to the floor? Yes. To the goes, ground? Goes off. Yeah, the bullet that, that actually hit Jose from Rico's gun actually went into his leg. Joining us this morning is Mike Morse and Corey's top journey. Mike Morse. Mike Morse is in here to tell us about the backpack giveaway here. Yeah, adapt and adapt and change things up a little bit every year. Welcome to another episode of Open Mic Podcast. I'm really, really excited about this one. I have Peter Wall, Attorney Peter Wall, s- sitting in here with me. Thanks for co-hosting this episode, Peter. Honor, honor and a pleasure. And I have Police Investigator Ira Lee Todd Jr. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we just met today for the first time. Yes. And I'm a big fan. And I've, I've heard of you in the past, and I, w- I was able to watch a new TV show that you're on called Wrong Man. Yes. So I want to get into all that. Um, but I want to first lay out your background because you have a really interesting background. I've, I've read your bio, but why don't you take us through, um, take us through your background. As a police officer? As a police officer and, and, and when that started and where we're at today. Well, I started in Michigan State Police back in the 80s, early 80s with Michigan State Police and I was on Governor Blanchard's security team, oh. Capital Security. Okay. And I got a little bored with that because I always wanted to be a police officer since I was a young man, you know. And so... You grew, up in, you grew up in Detroit? I grew up in Detroit. Okay, where'd yeah. you go to high school? I went to uh, McKenzie High School. Okay. And I grew up on 12th Street during the riots and everything else. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so I got to see all the tanks and all that crap, you know. Mm. But You're too uh, young for that. Come on. No, no, I'm 61. Going, on, going on 81. You look know? great, man. <laughs> but um, I left, left the state police and went to Detroit Police Department. And uh, I was there for about a year working patrol. And I met Benny Napoleon. And he offered me a job. He pointed a picture behind me. I got a penny. I love Benny. Benny is a good man. It's my favorite chief. He is? That's my favorite. Wait a minute. How many chiefs have you worked for? Oh, oh God. Several. I think my first chief was Hart. And you know the ones that came over there. I I think I worked for about 11 chiefs. I love, I, first of all, Peter, let's, 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 he's still on the job and he's telling us that Benny Napoleon was his favorite chief, wow. which is four or five ago. I don't know what That's that says it. about our current chief, but we, maybe we get into that. Maybe we don't. No, no. I, I love Chief Craig. Cause he seems like a great guy. He's yeah. a great guy. Okay. Good. And I'm not just saying that he's great. If he wasn't a great guy, I'd say it. I'd shoot from the hip. Chief who, 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 chief, which, wait, I was going to say, go ahead. Chief Hart was a good shoe salesman. Uh, salesman but, but Chief Hart was actually a really good chief. Don't I talk bet. about my chief. No, no, no. Right. no, 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 no you worked across the street from my school selling the shoes. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Which yeah. chief didn't you like? Uh, I didn't like Knox. I didn't not like Knox, but I thought Knox wasn't as professional. Uh, Ella Bully was a disappointment. Oh. I thought she was a real disappointment. We, we had high hopes for her first black female chief, and she was kind of a disappointment because she kind of was you know was led around by Kwame, of course. So she was probably my least favorite. I mean, I respected her and everything else, but she was a disappointment to me. Okay, and uh, but. And Napoleon was the best. He, and he was only there for a year or two. Yeah, but he was, before that, you know, he was he, he was an executive. He came up through the ranks, and he was my first, he was my lieutenant first before anything. And he's just one of those guys. He he take care of his people. He really loved his people, and he loved the citizens of Detroit. Yes. He's a lawyer, he's, too. It, he, went to, he did go to law school. Yeah. Yeah. With you? He was there, he's good friends with my mom, who's yeah. in law school. Really? Yeah. Great guy, yeah. And he's still a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to invite Benny. Somebody make a note. We're inviting Benny on the podcast. Oh, Benny's amazing. I, I really mean that, too. I mean, he's done a whole lot for me. When I got charged with murder back in 1993, Benny was right there for me. And even when, when it wasn't politically correct to be there for me, Benny was right there for me. The so you were, you were, let's talk about that. You were a police officer in 1993. for the You were you were working in the Detroit Police Department? Yep, I was working gang squad. And how did you get charged with murder? Well, one night we were working, we had this thing where we would have to go out right off the ramp. You go out, you have to go get your doping gun. So we were, you know, we were proactive. So we would go out there and shake a lot of dope guys down, gang guys down, and stuff like that. So we had got our dope and got our gun for the night. And at the end of the night, we would do what we call a sweep. And back then, what we would do, we'd go and look at look for curfew violators because curfew violators, you know, it was, a, it was an easy way to attack the gangs, you know, and gave enough probable cause to at least go and walk up to them and talk to them and find out how old they were and things like that. And it just kind of kept them congregating and everything like that. So on this particular night, you know, we got our arrest. One of our, it was three of us working. One of our partners took the dope down to get it analyzed. Me and Rico Hardy, we went to uh, Dooley's Coney Island on Burner. Uh, okay. And while we were there, one of the managers said, hey, it was a guy that ran in here with a gun. And he was with uh, another guy that he knew by the name of Killer. And he said the other guy he believed was Angel. So it was Angel and Killer that came in there. One came in with a sawed-off shotgun. His name was Killer. Killer. Oh, yeah. 
<clears throat> and you know, good, good is that, I assume it's a nickname. Wow. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. So Killer Kill actually got convicted. They he got pulled over one time. They found two bodies in the trunk of his car. So oh, he he earned his name, you know. <laughs> but we go out there and he tells us that Killer and Angel came into the place. They were looking for somebody. One had a sawed-off shotgun. One had a handgun. You're sitting there eating a coney. You're right. With yes. everything on it, probably. Yes, Little yes. fries That's on the right. side. Yes. And they say, and the owner says, T- guy ran in here with a gun. Yes. Okay, so what do you guys do? So later on, we go out and we just go walk in the block. And we're waiting for the rest of the crews because the crews would come around, around, I think it was like 10 or 11 o'clock around that time. They would come and we would do our sweep and, you know, shake the area down a little bit. It was real bad down in Southwest Detroit at the time. A lot of gangs were down there in Destiny, Southwest Detroit. And so we go out and we just start walking. And while we're walking, we walk past Yavara's bar. There was two individuals out there selling drugs. So me and my partner, partner, Rico Hardy, we said, just keep walking, act like we don't see it, and we'll wait till the rest of the crew get here. So we go down, and that's before cell phones. We go down and get on the phone, and we pretend we're on the phone. So when we're coming back, somebody yell out 5 You know, that was the common name for police, the alert name for police. They yell out 5 People start running. So we grab the two guys that we knew were selling, throw them on the wall, and we start shaking them down. Now, while we're investigating them, Angel comes from around the corner. He's walking up fast. So I tell my partner, Rico, you got one coming up on you like that. Now I'm the berm area officer. I'd stand on the berm and I just cover him. I don't do any patting down or anything like that. My, my responsibility is just cover him. So I said, Rico, you got one coming up on you. So he comes off the wall and he goes to investigate Jose El Zarabe, who is Angel. And at that time, they have some words. He started reaching. I see him reach. But by this time, I see two guys on the wall move. I think they're all together. So I start pulling. But they're looking at him. They see him reaching. So they're getting ready to get out of there because they're in the line of fire. So by the time I turn, this is split seconds, I hear pow. And I see my partner fall. Mm. So I step in front of him, and I just start shooting at the target who I thought had shot my partner. He falls. Next thing you know, everything's over. What We call for backup. We find out Jose didn't have a gun on him. Later learned that the gunshot I heard was actually my partner's gun. But from my vantage point, all I heard was a shot, saw my partner fall. Prior to that, I saw the guy reaching. So I shoot him and killed so, him. Wow. Yes. And how, how could it have been your, your partner's gun if he was falling? Yeah, what happened was, I guess, now this is what Rico said. I couldn't see from the vantage point, but when the guy was reaching, he said he tried to grab his hand with his opposite hand. Who's he? Who's he? Uh, Jose's hand. Uh, who was Angel. Your partner tried grabbing Grab Jose's, Jose's hand. Because he was that close. So uh-huh. when he's reaching, he's trying to grab his arm. And he said he's got his other hand on his gun. He's trying to pull his gun at the same time. And then what happened? Jose pushes him off. His guns go off. His gun goes out like to the floor? Yes. To the goes, ground? Goes off. Yeah, the bullet that, that actually hit Jose from Rico's gun actually went into his leg. Now at the time we didn't know that. So when I hear the shot. So he shot himself? No, he shot Jose in the leg. Well, Jose got the, the bullet, he but you said that bullet. your partner was going down. Yeah, he was. He pushed, Jose pushed him. Oh, he wasn't and going that's down made from a bullet. Gun. You thought he was going down from a bullet. Yes. He was going down from the shove. Yes. But see, I couldn't see it from there. So that. his gun shot this perp. Yes. But all I hear is a gunshot, see my partner fall. So and I, you reacted. I reacted. And like I, I, assume you, I assume you, were, you, you did what, as you sit here, how many years later... That's right. 25, 26 years later, you think you did the right thing. Oh, absolutely. And you did do the right thing. Absolutely. That's what we were trained to do. You know, so we, then, so then, obviously, chaos ensues. Everybody shows up. And when did you realize that they were going to... I mean, you realized he didn't have a gun, so you thought, shit, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Yes. Did you, did you think that right away? Well, we didn't know, because we didn't know if he still had... We didn't know at the, at the moment that he didn't have a gun. So initially, we thought, you know, by the time they recover him and pick up the body, they would recover a gun. Because what they normally do, they'll separate you from the scene. And they'll take you from the scene. And your, your supervisors will separate you. Yes. You've yes. Been, how long had you been on the force at this point? Uh, I think I was on the job about eight years. Then. Eight years. Okay. Yes, Keep going. So then, so then what happens? So they take you down to homicide, and they, they separate you, they kind of isolate you, and they give you a little time to kind of get yourself together before they start talking to you. And at that time, I don't know what's going on. They're processing the scene. They're doing what they do. And then later on, there was a detective by the name, I think it was Sergeant Peterson. He came in to talk to me, and he was the one that informed me, said, hey, couldn't find a gun. You know, he heard a shot. And at the time, Rico didn't know he fired a shot. Rico didn't know he fired a shot. He fired a shot. Interesting, right? Okay. Okay. So he didn't know he had fired a shot. So now everybody's looking at me, because I, I heard a shot. So look, I heard a shot, saw my partner fall, I reacted. 
It was like, maybe it was a car backfire. Now, I worked gang, I worked gang intelligence at the time, too, so we had been in a lot of shootings and everything else. I know the difference between a car backfiring and a shot fired, you know. So I'm thinking, like, what's going on here? What's going on here? And, I mean, it wasn't until trial when it came out that it was actually Rico's gun that the shot came from. That's when you learned it. That's when I what learned What was Angel it. reaching for? We don't know. Uh, we thought maybe he still thought he had his weapon. Or maybe it's one of those things he was just going to fake it out, you know. Well, because he died. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, how would you know? Well, we don't know, So right? there's no gun on him. There's no knife. There's no weapon. No he, he wasn't reaching for a cell phone. Right. He wasn't reaching for a comb, probably, to right. comb his hair. That's right. We don't know. What do you, I mean. Is that, because there's no weapon on him, is that the reason why you had to be prosecuted? Or was it malice green time and everything that went was, down to the City and that was, had to be prosecuted it was, like it that. Was, remember, it was Malice Green yeah. and what's the Rodney King time. So right. all those things were happening in succession. Sure. So did so you know were, Budson and those guys? And, yes, I yeah. knew them well. Okay. Yeah, I knew them well. And so that's that was the climate at the time. So they were just charging everybody. And even I even had a prosecutor tell me one time, well, we had to we wanted to let the jury sort it out, which I thought was kind of horrible. You're gonna let the jury sort out your so, life, right? Who was your attorney? Steve Fishman. One of the guys I love to the this man. day. He did Steve, a good job for you, obviously. Steve Fishman is the man. It, so, go ahead. I'm sorry, is Rico still around? Because he he's actually I just saw a post. He's actually having surgery today, uh, and uh, but he's still on the job. My one and only criminal case. He was the 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 officer, uh, you know, in front of the 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 uh, motel that's by City Airport. I'm sure you're familiar with that motel. Yes. I had some kid. You know, yeah. doing drugs. When yeah. you were doing a defense he was case. Very, he was a real professional. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you were brand, doing the defense case? I was defending this kid. He was, you know, I yeah. had my work cut out with for me. With oh, him. Yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Rico's a good cop, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good cop. So that was probably a scary time of your life. Oh, man, it was Oof. it was crazy. It was traumatic. How yeah. many months after the shooting did you get put on trial? I had to wait about a year. I was suspended without pay. Oof. I had to wait about a year. I only had about nine grand saved in my whole life. And I lived off that nine grand for the rest of the year. And how long was the trial? Travel's about a month, um, maybe three weeks, uh, three weeks to a month. In recorder's court? In recorder's court. And who court. was your judge? Um, Daphne Mean Curtis. Oh, wow. Yeah, Daphne Mean Curtis. Good judge. And I knew all these people because, you know, I've been in the courtroom. I had a lot of cases and stuff like that, so I knew all the defense attorneys. So, you, the so Steve Fishman gets you acquitted? Yes. Life is then good? It's, it's pretty good. I, what I did, I retired. I took a duty disability. I said, I'm just done. With Psychological. This. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm done. I've been in a lot of shootings. You know, now I'm a little upset because I'm thinking like, hey, how can I do my job? You know, and yeah. you just never know. Are you, you angry charged. at the department? Are you angry at the prosecutors? You've got to be angry at the world. I mean, you I would was, do it. I was more angry at the prosecutor's office. Now, for what I understand, the border police commission had already cleared me. And the prosecutor's office started, decided to charge me. But at the time, there was a guy by the name of Bob Backerzik, who I respected. He was uh, one of the main prosecutors down there. And I respect, I respect him to this day. But we were actually, before they charged me, we was actually sitting at a table together, uh, you know, working a case together. I was also in charge of a case. And he said, hey, I know about that case. Don't worry about it. You're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. The next thing I know, he's the one prosecuting me. Him and Maria Miller, who was the spokesperson for uh, Wayne County now. So, you know, we went through the whole trial and everything else. I was the only one to testify. And I just remember Pete Fishman did a, um, I think it was a court TV special or something. But I do remember him saying that the courtroom was quiet while I was testifying. I talk with my hands a lot, you know. Sometimes you can shut me up, you know. But I just told my story. I just told the truth. And the jury, you know. Believed you. So you believed took me. the stand. Oh, I took the stand. So how, why did it take a month if there was only one witness? No, it was, there was, no it was a bunch of women. They, brought, they found the, the two guys that ran off. Remember the two guys that yeah. we were shaking down initially? There was another female who actually saw identical what I saw. She thought that Rico was shot by this guy, too. That kind of helped me, too, because she came in and testified and said, you know, I saw Angel shoot this guy, you know, and I thought he shot the cop as well. So she kind of told the story from my vantage point, what she saw. Who was the prosecutor uh, it was, on this case? It was uh, Bob Ekazinski and Maria Miller. I need to ask a question. I mean, you're a professional. You acted, you know, according to your training. And yes, sir. Any contact with, I mean, you, there's a loss of life. And, I, you know, you seem like a compassionate person. Absolutely. Did you have contact with the family he, afterwards? Or he, was, he didn't have any family here. Okay. That was one of the things, too. He didn't have any family here. He was one of the guys, I guess, from the Marriott Boatlift or something. Oh, Marriott Boatlift yeah, from Cuba. That, yeah, that was okay. brought over here. So you know, Like he, Scarface. 
Oh yeah, he was. He, oh, he had the tattoos. He had a criminal history, a long criminal history, and everything else. He he wasn't a good guy, but he didn't deserve to die like that. So when you went off, uh, you went off in '93. Was there a workman's comp situation? Uh, did you get paid for the comp? Because <laughs> Peter Wall, Peter Wall's a workman's well, comp attorney. You got duty disability. But you, but what kind of disability do you? Have? I I went, I went up for duty disability. Duties. Okay. And what I did that's was, different than comp. It's an election. You can choose to get it. It's better. Yeah, yeah. it's more. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, we got, can't, I got like, can't double dip it. And I got like two-thirds of my pay. And how long were you off the job for? Just about a year. And then and what? Benny Napoleon called me. And said? He was starting up this task force, the Violent Crime Task Force. In the, city, in the Detroit Police in the, Department? In the Detroit Police Department. He was the, I think he was the chief then or the assistant. He was the assistant chief then because Ike was the chief then. And, you know, I told him I was thinking about coming back. You know, I missed the job. You know, guys would come by with their radios, and all of a sudden they get a run. They run out the backyard, you know, and I'm like, I'm sitting there like, oh, God, you know, I still got the police blood in me, you know. <laughs> and so I told him I was thinking about coming back. He said, well, I'm going to put you at this FBI task force. And he put me there, and I was there for 17 years. Wow. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. And that was a good thing. That was a great And what kind great. of things were you investigating during that 17 years? Everything. We did all the whole uh, high-profile cases. We did murder. We did mostly everything that was serial crimes, you know, like if it was serial robberies, you know, uh, um, murders, uh, like two or more people. We did all the high-profile police shootings. We did everything that was high-profile. We even did what we call apes, and apes are acute political emergencies. So those were the cases, like if the mayor called and said, look, I want this, uh, we were responsible for those cases. Monterey Motel, you were dealing with it? All of that. Oof. All of that. So it, Every major case you could think about, all the way back to like 1995, I've been on. Okay. So you did. Shooting. So you were on that task force until about 2010? Yes. And then what have you been doing from 2010 until 2019? I went back to like work the investigative operations section of the Detroit Police Department. I'm that, not sure what that is. That's, that's the IOUs. They used to be called it. Uh, investigative operation units. They call them investigative operation sections. And that was like in the precinct. That was your investigative unit inside the precinct. So they did the like smaller stuff like, uh, you know, larcenies or if you had a, something that happened in the precinct that could be handled in the precinct. So that's what you're on right now? No, I'm at the Homicide Task Force now. I've been there uh, since 14, 2014. So you did that for about four years. Now, for the last five years, you've been on the Homicide Task Force. Yes. Now, that's not precinct-wide. Is that the whole department-wide? That's whole department-wise. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter, I'm There's sorry. been some serial killers uh, that you've been working on. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. In our city, oh, I know yeah. it's hipster. There's a hipster makeover going on, but there's still serial killers and. Oh yeah, yeah. You you get a lot of that, you know, all the time. Sure. People it's, don't realize that. Yeah. I mean, I got I have lots of examples I want to talk to you about, but I, like Peter brought up an interesting point. Like, you know, people always say to me, "Oh, I hear Detroit's coming back. Detroit's back." Yeah. You know, the downtown area sure seems yeah. pretty safe. It's amazing. It, but. Yeah, it's amazing for all of us who grew up here, yes. right? And, and, and we're not too far in age. I mean, we're all we're all amazed. We all are enjoying this resurgence. But is crime going down? You know what? I think so. I think it's it's different. I think you have more violent offenders than we did before. It seems a little more crazier out there. And I think the offenders are getting a lot younger and just no remorse, you know, that kind of thing. What you, can you, be done? If you were the chief, what would you do to fix this? I would have more police. First of all, I give us give us decent salaries, medical benefits. You know, that's, it's kind of like after you retire. They don't get medical benefits. We don't get it once we retire. Okay, that's only reason. Oh, yeah. That's the only reason I stuck around for so long. I was dealing with cancer, so okay. I didn't want to leave. You know, and you know, leave my medical behind. So I think that's some of the biggest problem. If you gave cops good medical, uh, decent salaries, you know, where cops don't have to work overtime. You know, you got <laughs> cops out here working double shifts, working a lot of overtime. And this kind of job is too stressful. It burns you out, you know. So I think that, you know, cops should be working more than eight hours a day. They should be have a decent salary where they can go and, you know, have a normal life and good medical benefits. And we need more cops. I think more cops are better. That'll do it. I think so. So let's talk about something that you're passionate about and I'm actually – you're passionate about but interested in it. and I'm just as a just watching it is is the all the innocent projects yes. out there and I know that that's a focus of your life yes and uh, so you know I, I have your bio here talking about um, that you helped exonerate David Beeks David um, Beeks yes. so you know that sounds like an interesting story tell where'd us you, when was that and what, what happened there wow where'd you get that you did some that, digging huh dude that's on your bio from your TV show Wrong man. Oh, oh I never. Look, you never I, read this? Look at this. I've never seen that, that bio. That's uh, your. Uh, I, guess I, I guess I could show it on the. Uh, there's there there uh, uh, there's Ira. Uh, never saw and, that. And uh, I, I did I do my homework. I see. So I'm a lawyer. So so tell us about what happened. What year was that? David Beeks was in. I want to say it had to be in 
like around 95, 96. Maybe. So that was soon after being on the, uh, on the, on the, in the department? Force. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So what happened? I mean, I was working a lot of high profile cases and I was having a lot of luck with, you know, closing cases and stuff. So I was pretty good. So FBI would give cases to me, like, you know, the wine sims and stuff like that. And so somebody was writing me a letter. I can't remember if it's his girlfriend or, no, it wasn't a girlfriend. It was, it was a friend of the family or something. But somebody kept writing letters to this guy by the name of David Beeks. Is innocent. He's in jail for killing his girlfriend, and I kept getting these letters. And so I asked my boss. I said, "Hey, could I? Um, sorry, could I um, take a look at this case? Can I pull this file?" Somebody said this guy is innocent, and you know they just keep saying this guy is innocent. There's no way he could have done that. So we started looking at the file, and the file just didn't make sense to me. So I go and reinvestigate the file, then I find the real killer. And I go to the prosecutor's office, and I get a confession from the real killer. We writ him out. I talked to him. He confessed to me. Okay, and He confessed to me. I had an IRS agent sitting right next to me because back then on the task force, we had FBI, IRS. IRS? Yeah, we had everybody. What the hell has he got to do with it? Yeah, we've a multi-jurisdictional task force. The guy, we, you wanted tax money from hey, this guy? We, hey, we just use what the, we can use. This, this guy guy's was already in, in, in prison, right, I assume? Yeah. 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 David okay. Beeks yeah. was. His name was the... No, the, uh, oh, the new guy. Killer. Yeah, guy. Dorian Hollis. So he confessed to the murder that David Beeks was sitting in prison sitting for. Sitting in prison for. And so I take it to the prosecutor's office with a confession. They said, well, it's not enough. We got somebody in prison right now. We need more evidence. So I find Dorian Hollis' girlfriend, and just so happened that she saved some bloody clothes that he had, that he stored in the house after the homicide. Come on. So she gave them to us. So we take that to him, to the prosecutor's office. So you tested, you tested that and it yes, matched? everything matched and Lucky. everything else. DNA. And so we take that to them. So they decide that they didn't want to charge Dorian Hollis because Dorian Hollis, uh, not because Dorian Hollis, because David Beeks had already been convicted. And they said it'd be hard to convict somebody else of a case that somebody already been convicted of, which didn't make sense to me. No. I, I know. So we had to fight to get them to do a motion to set aside David Beeks' conviction. They didn't want to set aside his conviction. And so I went to, um, and I'll never forget, that. I think it was Gerald Evelyn. Was it Gerald Evelyn? That we went to Criminal think, defense attorney. Yeah, he did it pro bono. And we went to him and said, well, we need some help with this. You know, we need to get this guy's record clear. You know, now by this time, David almost committed suicide in prison. Oh, my and God. And this guy was a guy who couldn't read or write. He had an attorney that kind of just let him plea out to it. And he's the only reason he pled because they told him he would get the death penalty in Michigan. Oh. Is that ridiculous? Which there isn't which a death penalty. Right. And never have. Exactly. So, and this guy, you know, I met him. When I found him, I went to... Um, is it called Capuchin's Soup Kitchen on yep. the east side? And he was working there at the time. And when I went in there to go see him, this guy was so afraid to talk to me because he, he thought he was going to get railroaded again, you know. So he was out? He had got out. Yeah, he was out probably a month. And I said, hey, look, we got the real killer. And this old man just cried, man. How many years did he serve? He served, uh, I think he did 10 years. I think about 10 years or something like that. Yeah, eight that is or ten a years. Crazy story. Yeah, Isn't that crazy. Mm -hmm. So, wow. And, and and you mentioned. I mean, do you have any questions about that? I mean, it's it just it, it's mind blowing. The, the these cases and the fact that he served and got out is, is I guess bittersweet. It would have been nice to you know get him out yes. early, but yes. you you got onto it a little late. Was he pay? I mean, there's a certain amount of money you get every year being wrongfully. I, th uh, I think at that time, I don't think he got paid at all. I know uh, Arnold Reed. Had taken this case, okay. but I don't know whatever happened in that case. What? So you mentioned Devonte Sanford. He served eight years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. You uncovered the real killers again. Yes. What year was that about? That was in. So you're taking me back here. It, yeah, uh, ten years ago. It doesn't yeah, matter. I mean, been, so what, what happened there? I mean, well, what happened you, there? You have quite the history of doing this. It's 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 really well. I think once admirable. you once you sit at the defense table, you start realizing as a cop. You know, you want to make sure you so got that's the right the, person. So that, that's, I'm so glad you brought that back to, to, to your charges. That's why, is that your passion? Changed my you life. Because you knew you didn't do it, and yes. you were wrongfully being railroaded. Yes. Yes. You know, and when you see a case that, that isn't real, you want to stand up for these people. Absolutely. And so what happened with Devante Sanford? Why do you think that that case was so um, bad? Because we were, we were looking for, okay, at the time, we were investigating murder for hire groups. And the guy by the name of Vincent Vito Smothers was a guy that was, was part of this murder for hire group. And so we were investigating them at the time. Homicide was investigating the murders that he had participated in. 
But we were always responsible for tracking guys down and tracking their phones and stuff like that. So Homicide had got a warrant against this guy on one uh, murder for hire that he had done, him and a guy by the name of uh, Ernest Davis, and Ernest Davis was called Nemo. And they got a warrant on uh, Benson Smothers, and once they went to go execute the warrant, he took off. So he took off to Kentucky. So we started tracking his phone and doing things that what we do. I don't want to reveal all our secrets, Please. but we started tracking some of the stuff. And we found him in Kentucky. So I was in charge of doing the intel. So I started pulling up intel. Why would he, him and Nemo go to Kentucky? And I found a guy by the name of James Davis. And James Davis was a guy who was uh, allegedly uh, involved in kilo drug sales in Detroit. But he had left Detroit, went to Kentucky, and started developing property. And now he was just big, rich property developer. So I contacted one of the FBI uh, liaisons down in Kentucky, and I talked to one of the local guys in Kentucky, and, and I said, hey, do you guys know who this James... Uh, uh, Smothers? No, the other one, uh, Davis, James Davis is. And they said, we know all about him. We got a case right now. We're looking at him for you know uh, mortgage fraud, a whole bunch of other stuff. But we, we know he's a drug dealer from Detroit, and he's doing all these kind of things, and yes, we're watching. They had a task force watching him. So before I could get off the phone, there was a guy by the name of Sergeant Insminger, and he was with Kentucky uh, Police Department, one of the police departments down there. He said, I want you to be careful. He said, because this guy is connected with your mayor. I said, so what do you mean by that? He said, this guy brags about your mayor, getting the key to the city. Which mayor is this now? Kwame Kwame. Kwame. Kwame Kwame. Oh, shocker. What did you think? Well, I assume, but I wanted him to say it. Dennis Archer. I wanted him to say it. Yeah. And so... I, I'm at the bar, actually, when I get a phone call. I'm sitting in the bar having a drink with a couple of buddies, and this guy, I step outside, he's telling me this, and I'm like, oh, my God, i got to tell somebody because it's our mayor. So I called one of my lieutenants who was a buddy of mine that I worked gang squad with. We came up together, you know, worked gang squad with, and I say, I got some information, blah, 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 blah. I want to tell you right now before I get too drunk here, you know, that kind of <laughs> thing. And I told him all about it. So he said, tomorrow we just do some paper. So the next day I go in and I, I do some paper, but I get called in by a commander and. Uh, it was James Tober at the time. And he tells me, don't put anything in writing. I'm trying to remember this right now. Some of this might be a little off. But they tell me not to put anything in writing. But when somebody tells you don't put anything in writing. <laughs> you put that in writing. You put it in yeah, writing. Exactly. You'd be sure. That means put it in writing. Yeah. So I put it in writing, but I didn't put it in our normal systems. So what I did, I put it in writing and I gave it. You put it like, like Trump does. You put it in a separate system. Yeah, a separate oh, system. That's right. That's situation. right. And what I did, I did what we call a progress note. I just did a progress note. Instead of putting in an official report because the mayor's name and everything else like that. So I was following orders. and But I give that report to this lieutenant. Now, it was supposed to be kept quiet. And at the time, we had already arranged with the FBI and a couple other people on the task force, we were going to fly down to Kentucky and meet with these uh, officers from Kentucky and the agents from Kentucky and kind of put together what we had and what they had and trying to find out what's going on. And at the same time, we were still looking for Vincent Smothers, who was wanted on one of these murder for hires. So by that time, Vincent Smothers started coming back, and we started pinging his phone, and we saw him coming back to Michigan. So we knew that he was, uh, had a wife that uh, lived in Shelby Township. So we alerted Shelby Township Police Department and said, hey, this guy is heading back this way, so he may come there. Will you keep an eye out? Because at the time on our task was all the state police, they were off uh, on the weekend. So I was just responsible, just, you know, sometimes, it was some kind of something Nothing, going No on. crimes are just, occurring just on the weekend. Task, so just a task good. force, though. Just, just a task, task force. The regular yeah. troopers are Let's right. not talk about state police where <laughs> I come I, from. I got, I got a ticket on uh, uh, Saturday. Uh, so one, of my, one of my best friends is a, is that's, a trooper. That's keep right. going. And they are the best. Yep. And so um, so I was responsible. If anything happened, they would have called me, you know, because I was one, one of the ones that was working that Saturday. So I get a call from Shelby Township say, hey, we got Vincent coming out. With his wife and baby, we got him in custody. What do you want us to do? So I called the lieutenant up. I said, hey, we got him, blah, 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 this. And he said, well, shoot out there and get him. Then I got a call from somebody from Homicide and said, hey, his wife is there. What do you want to do? I said, I think we should lock her up, too, because we had information that she had driven one of the vehicles Ooh. away from another murder that he had done. So I wanted to talk to her as well. So I worked 27 hours on this case straight, and I wound up getting a confession from his wife, who took us to out. Where he had hit all the guns, and all the guns matched all these different cases too. Jeez, oh, and man. I got a confession from him. I got like nine confessions from him, and then I turned it over to the other officers. Nine Excuse confessions. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Nine confessions for nine different murders. Yes, yes. It's a big day. 
So, and so uh, that's keep going. I mean, live a day for us. You know, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> what we do, you know. God bless. But so we do that, and all of a sudden, things, uh, this commander comes in, and things started getting a little weird. Mm -hmm. So I'm, in, I'm still in there interviewing him, you know, and you never interrupt somebody when they're doing an interrogation. You never do that. He pulls me out the media and starts telling me what I should do, who, what I should ask, and don't ask about this. Ask about that, things hmm. like that. And I thought it was strange. Red flag. Yeah. And I was one of the guys, that, I was known as one of the better interrogators, you know, at the time. So nobody really told me how to interrogate. I usually did my thing, and I was pretty successful at doing my thing. Apparently so. And so, I mean, all of a sudden, it just things just start getting a little weird. And so fast forward to everything that happened, we find out that the guns that Cecily, his wife, had taken us to matched this Runyon case. The Runyon murders. Now, at the time, I didn't even know somebody was locked up for the Runyon murder. It was Devontae Sanford. Mm. And so now I kind of know what they were trying to keep quiet, you know, because somebody was locked up on that. So I started making this think about it. I said, hey, look here, we got a hitman saying, hey, I did this murder, saying I don't know that kid, never met him before in my life. I don't do murders with kids. I'm a professional. And Vincent Smothers kind of got they trained. I mean, they were really good. They would even dress up before they do some of the hits. You know, they were, I mean, they were really professional, though. They would fly out of town and do wow. hits and wow. pretend to be homicide detectives or wow. something like that. Yeah. It's like Murder, that's Inc. It's like yeah. out of the yeah. movies. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He was very, like I mean, he, this guy was smart. And, but he said, no way I did anything with this young guy. He said he wasn't there. I don't even know him. And so... So tell us how hard was it to get Devontae Sanford out of prison? Oh, my God. I mean, because, well, you know, sitting here, I, I'm a lawyer. Peter's a lawyer. But we would assume that that would be pretty easy to get somebody out of prison if you have a confession from a serial killer and you had nine confessions and the guns are there and it all checks out. How did you get Devontae Sanford? How did that process work? Oh, God. It was, was, it was, it? It was horrible because we started talking about it. I know they were trying to get him out and there was... Prosecutor was fighting it. Everybody was fighting it. Police department was trying to say, oh, no, Vincent Lyon, he's just trying to cover for this boy, wow. this and that and this and that. So Devontae had an appeal coming up. And one of the appellate attorneys called me, I cannot remember her name, and asked me if I would be an expert witness at this trial, at this, this appeal. And I told her I would. And, you know, we went over the statements that uh, uh, one of the officers had taken from Devontae Sanford and I kind of criticize, but you can you know you can go back and look at everybody's work, and you can find something wrong with somebody could find something wrong with my work if you went back over and critiqued it. Mm -hmm. But I was just saying there were some things that wasn't done correctly, or you know maybe they kind of planted some seeds unintentionally or unintentionally. I don't know, but I just knew this guy didn't do this murder, you know. I got a question. Yes. Do you think Kwame hired these guys to kill that dancer at the party? I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. I really okay, don't. Good. No. I think there was there was some association with it because some things that I really don't want to talk about right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 of course. But I don't think Kwame said go kill this person. I think there were some things that said that some people took it upon themselves to make some things happen. Are we going to talk about that? <laughs> well, Peter, no, we could. I, mean, you know, I, mean, we I was still... I didn't mean to hold come. on. I'm sorry. But I, we don't... <clears throat> you know, Peter, Peter wants to talk about strippers, but I <laughs> want to talk strippers. about... I want to... But, but Devontae Sanford, from the time that you got this confession... To the time he got out of prison, how long of a period was that? Well, it took about about four years. I think it took about four years. Yes, and it just blows my mind. Oh, it's it's weird because when they found out that the appellate attorney asked me to be their expert, prosecutors that uh, appellate attorney called me and said that he wanted me to be their expert. So now I'm working for both, and then he said, "Well, I want you to look at this file and tell me if you see anything and those kind of things." So it was uh, Joe Puglio, and. I said, well, look, I don't want to do this by myself, but they didn't want the, the brass to know in the police department at the time because they didn't trust them. They said, well, we don't want anybody to know. I said, well, look, I didn't get in trouble for some other stuff. I don't want you guys getting me in trouble and somebody saying, hey, we didn't tell you to do this, you right. know? Right. So what I did, there was a buddy of mine uh, that worked at Wayne County Sheriff's Department, and he worked on our task force before, and I really trust him. He was outside our agency. So what I did, the next meeting I had with him, I just showed up with him. They got a little upset, but I said, no, I need somebody that can cover my back and, you know, just so... If something go wrong, nobody could say, I wasn't doing that for the prosecutor's office, you know. So we go over there and we look through the files and we try to find a connection between Devontae Sanford, uh, Ernest Davis, Nemo, any of, any of Vincent Smothers' crew. And you couldn't? Zero. I mean, I went back to school records. I mean, I went back to everything. I mean, we talked to family members. Are you talking to Devontae Sanford during this time? No, I had no communication. I was just talking to his attorney at the time. And so... 
No, nothing. We couldn't find anything. I mean, I went everywhere. We talked to all of his family, different people associated with him. We talked to Vincent. I tried to find somebody that maybe could say, hey, they connected this way. Or so something. are you working on this for years? I worked it for about a year. Yep, and secretly. we work on other secretly. Secretly with the prosecutor's oh. office and uh, department. So you're doing your, you're you're still on the Detroit Police Department. You're doing your day job. Yes. You're secretly trying to help this man, Devante, even though you weren't being paid to do it. You're right. just because out of the kindness of your heart, um, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, you got a kid that was locked right. up for a murder, a, quad, old- a quadruple murder, at 14 years old, that he didn't. I mean. The claim was he walked up while they were out there doing the canvas and said, hey, I'm responsible for that murder. I'm the one that did that. You know, I went in there and he executed all these people by himself. A 14-year-old guy, mentally challenged and blind in one eye. You knew that was bullshit. It, total bullshit. From the beginning. Yes. Yes. And four years later, I mean, I, we don't have time to go through the whole story. I'd love to because I got six more stories here. Mm-hmm. But when he gets out, eventually, are you there? I'm putting one there because at the time I didn't want to kind of, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to be that kind of guy that's going to take the glory mm-hmm. from him or take the, take the, take anything away from him. You know, that was his moment. That's right. So I didn't I'm not to... sure everybody would feel that way. Oh, have you ever met Devante? Never met him. Never met him. Does that surprise you, it's Mr. Wall? This yeah. is a mensch. That's a good guy. You never met him. Never met have him. Have you met anybody of his family? No, nope, never met him. No. Do you know Other how he, than the people I talked to that find out they were related to Vincent's mother. But sure sounds that he would still be sitting in prison right now if you didn't do what you did. Well, I think it helped. I think it definitely he helped. He knows you. Oh, right. He's yeah. Stay, yeah. Yeah. But there's been no contact. No contact whatsoever. Is he living in Detroit? Not that I know of. Do you know where he is? No. Don't know. That'd be an interesting just, meeting. Just glad he's out. You know? I, 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 I'm... I'm sure he and his family are very thankful for you. And you also, so this confession, I want to talk about confessions, but, you know, your bio also says you you, you assisted in the Detroit serial killer case um, where John Eric Armstrong confessed to killing several women in southwest Detroit. That was not too long ago. No, not too long ago. That was that was a few years ago, too. Um, he was he was in the Navy, and that was, that was the first time I realized that, you know, you, you, some of these guys are they really they really a little touch, but John Eric Armstrong, Anthony Eric Anthony John Armstrong, right? What is John Eric Armstrong? John Eric Armstrong. I'm trying to remember his name. I remember we had an incident where hookers started getting killed in Detroit. Somebody was grabbing them up and killing them. I remember. So that. so we started looking at it and we found a Dearborn had, I think one that this guy had went into the stage and said he found a body. It was John Armstrong. And so at the time, they didn't think anything of it. They just thought he had found this body or whatever like that. So what we did, we just worked for a guy by the name. I got to mention his name, too. His name was Commander Dennis Richardson. Everybody called him Doc. And we always talk about this guy was probably one of the best detectives, commanders, bosses, cared about the city, cared about everything that you ever want to meet. He, he taught you. He trained you. So basically, we went out and we took the whole task force. We flooded the area. We looked at the areas this guy was targeting people at. We flooded the area, and what happened, John Eric Armstrong, he basically tried to abduct another woman, tried to strangle her. She got away, so she was able to pick him out. So we went out there looking for him. We find him. We pick him up, and we started interviewing him. So me and a guy by the name of Don Johnson started interviewing him. Wait a minute, Don Johnson on Miami Vice? Not that one. Different Don Johnson. Yeah, different Don Johnson. Because he was in yeah, Miami. He I was know. in Miami for a while. I'm sorry. Go ahead. T-shirt, sport coat thing. But we were able to, you know, get a confession from him. And I was able to get, I mean, several other confessions from him because he killed all over the world. You know, in Thailand and, I mean, all over the So these world. guys, how the hell are you getting so many confessions? Like, what, what's your, how are you, how, what's your trick? Empathetic listening. Okay, That's explain it. what that means. You listen to somebody. People want to tell you the truth. I really believe that. I believe everybody's good. I really believe that. And people think I'm stupid for believing that, but I really believe everybody's good. And when you do something wrong, people want you to know. They want to tell you. They want to disclose that to you. So you just have to find some sort of vehicle to get them to do that. And so what I do, I just sit there and I talk to them like human beings. And some of these people have never been talked to like human beings. So if you get a guy that come in there dirty and, you know, he's on drugs and he's, you know, killed a couple of people and he's all screwed up, First thing they expect for somebody to treat him like he's been treated the rest of his life. So first thing I do, I used to keep toothbrushes and washcloths and soap in my desk drawer. I would take him to the bathroom, clean him up. Wow. And I tell him, hold your head up. You know, hold your head up. You don't have to don't hold your head down. Everybody does something wrong, you know. And I say, you're here because you did something wrong. 
but we're going to talk about it. And I would give them their rights and, and really advise them of their rights and let them know that you got the right for this and the right for that and everything else. And then just start talking to them about, you know, where did they go wrong? And I always like talking to, I call it the nine-year-old. But I always talk to that younger person before, you know, everybody go bad at some time or first time you tell a lie or something. Everybody, you know, go through that stage in their life. But I always talk, try to talk to that person before they went through that and find out you who find they were. find their inner child, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and then find out, you know, what went wrong. You know, did somebody That's screw up smart. you. Yeah, and bad people, things that people who have bad things done to them normally do bad things to other people. And so I just kind of like, you know, you find some kind of way, you know, if we have a minimization rule, some way to minimize and say, you know, maybe you did that because, you know, of alcohol or something like that. And it is some circumstances. Maybe they did it because they were on drugs or they were enraged at the time or, or, you know, something happened in their childhood. But you just talk to them and people will reveal what the whole issue is and they'll tell you the truth. Wow. Stuff. Yeah. I really believe that. I it's amazing. What, and I'm sure you got hundreds of stories like this. And, and, and all of this um, have, has led you to being a TV star. I don't know about a star, but... I TV. watched it, and you're on Stars. Yeah. So you're yeah. a star on, on stars. stars. So I... Wait till you Pe see second season. It's going to blow your mind. So Peter, has, Peter did not know he was doing this interview, so he did not get to go home last night like I did and watch your show. Tonight. Let's let's talk about it. It's called Wrong Man on the Stars Network. Yes. 2018, you did six episodes. Yes. Um, I found out um, by doing my research that they just picked it up for a second season. Yes. Are you fully shot? Fully shot. And how many episodes in the second season? Same thing, six. And, and you're in all six episodes. All six episodes. And it's 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 kind of like Making a Murder. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you did you watch Making a Murder? Some of it. Just just it wasn't good as Wrong Man, so I just stopped watching it. Well, that was a few years before. Yeah, I know. I'm just talking. So about that's that. actually a pretty good show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. that's a that's a innocent. Did you see it, Peter? No. Yeah. Make a murder. No. Highly recommend. Fascinating story. But set my VCR tonight. Set your VCR. VCR. So, um, <laughs> so wrong man is a show where you are profiling several people who you guys on your sh on the show thought were wrongfully committed. Well, at least they're wrongfully convicted. And I they're, proclaim, say. they're proclaiming their innocence, and they have been for several years. Since the beginning, pretty yes. much. Yes. So let's talk about it. I mean, the first person, the first two episodes are about uh, a young man, 14 years old. I'm seeing lots of similarities through some of the stories you just told me. Yes. Um, Evaristo Salas. Evaristo Salas. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, I mean, you know, you couldn't have scripted that better. And and a lot of people who are watching this or listening to this probably have not seen the show yet. Yeah. And I, I recommend, um, you know, watching it. And, but, and I don't want to, I guess I don't want to, uh, you know, give it all away, but I think we're going to have to give it all away, yeah, well, you know, to talk about it. First season, spoiler alert. First season, spoiler yeah, alert. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Peter, for your sake, I mean, this is, this is, you know, I think well, he was six, well, he was 14 when I think the crime Correct. was committed. And it was a story about a, a man and a woman and a baby getting out of their car um, the man was on, uh, in the passenger seat and he got out of the car and somebody came over and about a six foot tall person came in and, and, and put two in his head, one in his head, one in his neck. And um, they didn't know who it was for over six months. And then there's this, there's this detective who, um, his, his name was Rivard. Uh, Rivard. Rivard. And uh, this, this, this cop who uh, saw this young man, Salas, in the police station for something else, decides to take his picture, even though he wasn't, he wasn't charged with anything, he wasn't um, accused of anything, hmm. and he took three Polaroid pictures, threw it, allegedly his story is he threw it on the table, he had an informant there who said, that's your killer of, of the person they were, they were investigating, yeah. and um, they charged this 14-year-old with murder, and this is 20 years ago, and I'm not going to give the punchline yet because it's conf it was confusing to me watching those two episodes. So before we get to the punchline... That's a question. He's a juvenile, though. This he's, is not, he's, he's not tried as an adult or he's not prosecuted like an adult. No, he was prosecuted as an adult. He was, Even yeah. though he's 14 years old. Yep. Yep. And so, first of all, when people watch this show, which I hope they do, how much of this was scripted? 
Was any of it bullshit, or did you and your partner on this show, Ira, uh, uh, Joe Kennedy and you, he was the other investigator. Yes. I mean, how much of this did you guys really put together, and how much of the confession of the informant was real? 100%. Come on. Zero scripting. 100%. They let us do our thing. They let me do my thing. Zero percent. Well done. So yes. you, you got, he got, 20 years later, a retired cop to admit to certain things. The he got the retired cop doing his empathetic listening to basically lie to him. He set him up in a lie. The cop lied to him. He then we'll find him he him. found the informant, which was not easy to do because the informant didn't want to get found. The informant admitted to Ira with his face blacked out, with his voice changed, that I lied in this case. And it took me three months to get him to tell the truth. To even... So that I Talk didn't know on the show. That's an interesting point. Oh, yeah. Three months? About three wow. months. Yeah. I, I would communicate back and forth with him, and he was a little reluctant. But we knew that there was something fishy about all this because this was the same informant because we pulled records. And we found out this Detective Ray Byard had paid the same informant on a bunch of other cases. Now, this was his first homicide. He was normally like a narcotics detective. And this informant... Was the guy that every time he busted somebody. Same informant. Same his informant. favorite same informant. It's weird. I didn't even know informants got paid money like this. That yes. was his living. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And this guy, you, so wait a minute. So the show is an hour. So you investigated this for three months. Three months. Finally got him to talk to you. Got him to talk to He me. admitted to lying yes. on the stand at a jury trial where they convicted this young man. Yes. You then took him to a polygraph exam. Yep. He passed the polygraph exam right. saying that the cop made me lie. Yes, yes. And he actually showed us other cases where he had lied on other cases and had other people convicted for dope that they didn't have. Oof. And the cop actually, he said the cop would actually give him dope. And it, because if he wanted this guy, this cop kind of ruled with an iron fist too in this little town, little small town. He didn't come off that way. Now, oh no, he was, I'm telling you, he was smooth. He was nice. Very nice, very nice. Smooth. Cagey. You know? Oh yeah. Oh, but, yeah. But, but, but the problem I have with the show is you have a cop lying to you. Mm -hmm. You have an informant saying, I lied on the stand. He passed a polygraph test. And then the show ended. There was no bow. There was no neat, neat little bow at the end of the show. You didn't say what steps were being taken to get him out of prison. As I sit here today, I don't know if he's in prison, out of prison. I don't know anything. So you watch second season. Uh -oh. Is it in the second season? You got to watch second season. Oh, my goodness. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. Yep. Second season. All right. Well, I didn't love how you left that hanging. I turned on the third episode thinking I was going to learn it, and you went on to Curtis Flowers. Yeah. And... Um, so I highly recommend this. This, I mean, it was it was fascinating. And when you watch it, you're hearing from the man himself that it wasn't bullshit, that it was real. It was and the fact that you were able to, I mean, when you were shooting the show, and I've been on a couple little TV shows here and there. I mean, did you realize what you had and what was happening? This was, I mean, you have a guy sitting in murder probably his rest of his life, and you found out that the informant lied. He admitted to it, and you have a polygraph proving it. What are you guys thinking? We, we, we were just amazed. Were we, you? We were you amazed. blown away with the producers of the show and the, the writer, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, they, Bellinger, is that his name? Joe Berlinger. Berlinger, he, was he blown away? He's amazing. He was, everybody was blown away. We didn't, wait till you see this season. It's like something else going to blow your mind. What channel is it on? Stars. It's on stars, stars Network. Do you get Stars? Yes, oh so yeah. There's a free seven-day uh, thing if you need it, Peter, or I can help you with the money. <laughs> Just get the channel. But, uh, Great stuff. That 247. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. It's right. so something called It'll Cable. Be. Not Rabbit Ears, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I want you to know, I thought you were great in the show. Thank you. Well, yeah. I was, you know, actually I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor, and oh, I was great. dealing with cancer really, really bad then. I mean, I was in bad shape on that show, and these guys, they took care of me. They took care of me. I'm telling you, I would. You, if you look, if you watch, watch closely. Everybody else is in summer clothes. I got on turtlenecks and long johns. Why do you else. do this? You know what? I was dying at the time, and uh, I had almost died three times. I was doing really, really bad. I had some personal stuff going on in my life. Cancer was eating me up. I mean, I had surgery. I was just, I was at my low. And I get the phone call. I've been doing TV consulting for over 25 years. And I get the phone call, and they say, "Are you interested in doing this?" And I just said a prayer on it. And I just realized once I started doing it, it helped me helping somebody else. It pulled me out of my hole 
Because when they, I read the case about Curtis Flowers, I said, here there's a guy that was on death row, and now he's serving a life sentence. He got his death row, you know, I guess, mm-hmm. set aside. But he's, he's serving a life sentence and claiming he's innocent. So I said, here's a guy waiting to die in prison, and he can't do anything to help himself. Here it is, I'm waiting to die, but I can move around. So I said, I need to do something to try to help him. And it actually helped me. And that's real talk. You're a good man. That's great. Yeah, I try to be. You are a blessed, I, good I, man. I got some skeletons, though, but I, I try to be. I don't okay. care about your skeletons. <laughs> you know what? Well, none of us are perfect, but yeah. wow. Yeah, I try to be. So, so, you're, so, you're, so you're healthy. Yes. You look Going, great. I'm are you cancer-free? Good. Not yet, but I'm getting there. I'm good. My numbers are good. Everything is good. So. I'm going to be saying prayers for you, my Please. friend. That's what works. I'm so happy That's to meet what you. Works. Yeah. Um, so season two is out. It's not out. February 9th. That's the word okay. I'm getting. It's not official. How 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 did the first season do? First, it did real well. People loved it. Are you, are you getting recognized on the street? Uh, all the time. I was in New York. A couple Come of guys, on. I swear, a couple of the the Coney guys. I got videos of it. <laughs> guys like, hey, that's that guy. And a lot of people know me. I wear hats all the time. Just my comfort blanket, you know. And a lot of guys recognize for my crazy little hats or whatever like that. But guys would stop me on the street and say, you that guy. And this season while we were filming, we were actually in a rural area. And somebody rolled by and said, what's the show about? And they said, Stars Run, man. And they said, is that Ira Todd? And everybody was amazed. You know, it made me feel good. You That's know? really good. Yeah, it's really good. So, you do have that quality, like that, that you know, you can't quanti- you know, quantify or what's the word. You just see, you have a good, some, good TV thing. Good you know? vibe or something. Yeah, you have a yeah. good vibe. Could it be, you know, I look a little bit like Denzel Washington or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. A little bit. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Bit. No. So what's next? So you got the TV show. You, you, you're. How long are you going to be in the police department for? I'm, I'm retiring this January. Oh, okay. Yeah, Congratulations. I'm, I'm, I'm retired this How January. many years on the force will you have been? Thirty five years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and I, so and what's I, next? Well, I'm, I'm still doing TV. Is consulting. that is that going to be the the next career? That's my thing. You know, I don't want to do a whole lot. I'm tired. So I'm do you tired. do any consulting for these like live PDs or forty eight hours? I, I haven't seen the empathetic listening in 48 hours when they're interviewing. Yeah, yeah 48 hours is a little different. Yeah, okay. Must be. Have you ever, when you're doing your empathetic listening, do you ever think that this person is psychotic and that is not going to work? They're truly evil? Have you encountered that Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get yeah. that a lot of times. When you yeah. start talking to you, you'll see some people are really, really sick, sociopaths. Sociopath. You know, okay. And you'll see that some people just really don't care. But you'll, you'll start reading that. And I just don't listen to people. I read like the nonverbal indicators. That's the most important thing. It's not what they say. It's you know, it's what they do. Yeah, uh, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's those kind of things. Uh, so, retiring in January, you're going to keep doing the show. Tell us what what other shows have you worked on? Low Winter Sun. Uh, I've worked on the, um, Detroit 187. Well, that was a good show. Yeah, I did some stuff with Beverly Hills Cops. I did some stuff. Beverly Hills uh, Cops with uh, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was one of my favorite movies. Did you know years? Chief, uh, what's his name uh, in the movie? The yeah. guy from Detroit. What's Gil Hill. Gil Hill. Gil Hill. Yeah. What, what was Gil Hill's name in Beverly Hills Cops? Gil Hill. Inspector Todd. Oh, Spe- oh did they take no. that from you? Inspector Todd. You, because a, of you? I knew a friend uh, that uh, that worked for him, and they, they decided for Todd. I was about to swear. I'm not going to swear, but that's exciting. These yeah. guys are too young to remember yeah, they, uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Anybody here back see, were, see it besides in, Newman? They were in diapers. You, see, you guys did? They were in diapers. Is he still with us? They must have been some big diapers. He, he passed away. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some big diapers for your yeah, partners oh, yeah, back yeah. there. But I've, done, um, I've done a lot of documentaries, a lot of documentaries for A&E. I've done stuff for Court TV, the old Court TV. You know, I was my, my whole trial was on Court TV. Oh, Your wow. trial was? My whole car, trial was on Court TV. And then you went back to Court v- TV to help them? Yeah. It's not even around anymore, is no, it? No, it's not around anymore. Do but they I, pay you for all these things? Oh, yeah, I got paid. Yeah. You get paid well? So, nah, I mean, you know... How much are you making from the new uh, show? I'm not making what Mike Morrison's making. You <laughs> what? <know>. what? <laughs> Do you know... I'm not making what you make. making. Listen, I probably, hey... <laughs> Um, I, I do I do really well though. I but do they really pay well. you for the show. They pay me for the show because you work hard. It sounds like. Oh, you how many hard. How many months did it take to f- uh, to film season one? Season one was about six months. Season two it took us about nine months. We stopped filming in September. And how do you film that and work full time for DPD? When I was you know early on in my career, I didn't use sick time or comp time, so I had over like two thousand hours of comp time. Oh wow! So when I got sick, I just I put in my papers that I need some time off. They give me my time off. They didn't really bother me because I never used sick time. So I would just use my time, you know. You still probably have hours banked. I, I guess a little bit left. I've been using up. That's why I've been. I've <laughs> you been, retire. You, gotta, that does, you don't take that with you. You, you, you can take some of it with you. You can take but seven just, years and then retire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just use it up. Use it really? Up, you know? Yeah. So tell us about what's what's going on in the city of Detroit now. You're, you're, you like 
Chief Ta, uh, Chief, Chief Craig, Craig, who Chief I like Ta. too. I've met him a few times. Yeah. He well, the first time I met him, he joked with me that uh, that I'm on TV more than him, and he didn't like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's great on TV. Yes, he's a good communicator. Yes, um, loves what he do. I love what he does too. He brought uh, out, I think he brought our department to the 21st century. I think okay. he's done some really great things with our department. I mean, really, with the you know Intel Center and everything else. Smart guy. I mean, really smart guy. But he can't really. You got how? You got lots of officers, and some of them, it's turning out, aren't some. There's some bad eggs. Right. And right. he can't really control that. But it found. It seems like when he finds one, he speaks the truth and doesn't try to protect the bad eggs. Is that true? Is that your sense or not? Oh your yeah, sense? he doesn't sugarcoat anything. I, 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 yeah, he's he's. I believe he's a real honest guy. And if if he say something, he's telling you what he really feels. He's he's not a political at all. I really believe that. You know, and I mean, I got his phone number. I can actually call him. So that's what kind of guy he is. Where what's his number? Give us a cell phone. You want cell number? <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's your, call him up so, right now. <laughs> for your listeners. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They may want to text him. Yeah, but he's uh, a. Re- I'm telling you, really good guy from here. You know, he actually started at the Temp Precinct. Yeah, and then he went down where, to L.A. Afterwards. L.A. Yeah, and he was L.A. for a few years. Yeah, yeah. And he's back. Yeah. So he's, now, is he going to be around for a while? You think? I think so. I hope so. What do you think of our mayor? I love Doug, and I love Doug. Doug called me his top cop years ago. And it was a case when he was a prosecutor. You know, Duggan was our prosecutor. Yeah, yeah. And Duggan was a badass. He was my friend. But Duggan was a badass. Duggan was one of the kind of guys roll his sleeves up. When you take that tie down, he going to hold you accountable. Okay. And when he was running the prosecutor's office, we had this, this case where um, a bunch of kids were getting killed. And so he created this task force. I forget what it was, but I worked part of the task force. And what, what we had one time, we had this female hit, hit woman who was trying to shoot somebody, and she wound up killing this kid accidentally. And they had her in for questioning. They, and she didn't lawyer up anything, but they couldn't get her to talk. But she never lawyered up anything, and they couldn't get her to you know, say anything. She was lying about some different things, but couldn't really tell the truth about anything. And they said, Duggan had somebody call my commander, and they called me, and I went and I copped her out. I copped her out like in two hours. And so we had a big meeting afterwards in front of a whole bunch of prosecutors and all these lawyers. He pointed out, he said, that's a top cop. Wow. What what is cop, you copped her out, what does that mean? I, I got a confession oh, from okay. her. I got a full confession from her. That's that, that's that cop. That's, that's, yeah, I, don't yeah, know yeah. Without, I don't know what they're going to do without you when, when you when you finally retire. You better teach your skills to these young men behind they, you uh, here. Both are some of the, um, I'm telling you, those are some of the baddest officers. I'm telling you, Richard Hauser and, and Theo... What's your last name? Sorry, oh, Williams. Theo Williams. Yeah, I'm. I'm, looking. I'm really. I'm. I'm being honest about that. They look they like are, babies. But they are some of the best cops. And like a lot of people, they all kind of criticize not these guys, but like the, even the younger ones, like ten years on the job, and say they're not the same. No, you got a lot of cops. These guys out are here. legit. They work hard. We're in good shape with them. Oh, absolutely, is what you're saying. We're, when you retire, we're in good shape because absolutely. of these guys. Absolutely, and guys like them. Oh yeah. Well, listen, I, I'm. I'm blown away by these stories. I'm going to pre-invite you back after I get to watch season two. Will you come back? You're going to love season two. Will you come back? Absolutely. I want yes, your sir. commitment. Absolutely. And um, thank you for your service. Thank you for I, I I'm thrilled to have met you um, and and to know that there are good people out there like you protecting us. That. It's just the stories are amazing. I can't wait to go watch season two on Stars. Peter, any final words? I, have you been back to Dooley's? I haven't been back. You know what? Hit, you would not recognize the hipster makeover of that place. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember yeah. how. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you a story about Dooley's, you know. Sure. I, I stopped going to Dooley's. I went downstairs to use the bathroom, and I saw the guy cutting up the onion, <laughs> kill a fly, and then still cut them out. I said, I'm Probably done with done? Yeah, that was, right. that, was, that was 20 years ago. That's not yeah. a good commercial. No, no, no. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. On the uh, onion fly story, <laughs> right. we're going to end yeah. the interview. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Thanks. Peter, Thanks for, for coming. Me. Thank you. And um, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Open Mic. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching Open Mic. I hope you've been enjoying the episodes. Please subscribe over here. Watch all the episodes. Like the episodes. Share the episodes. And subscribe. Subscribing helps me and it helps get the word out. So do it. Enjoy the episode. Share with your friends and family. And keep enjoying.